Welcome to Comics Bazaar, the channel of comics commentary and arcana. This video features the Uncanny X-Men number 308, cover dated January 1994. So the cover here by John Romita Jr. and Dan Green. We've got those very distinctive Dan Green ink brush marks here on Cyclops' uh, thigh and uh, rest of his costume. I really like it. I love the magenta on the cover as well. Don't get too much magenta on covers or in comics in the modern era. So this is quite a nice one. And the cover caption is Mixed Blessings, a turning point in the lives of the X-Men. And the turning point features the engagement of Jean Grey and Scott Summers. So just one other thing to note before we go inside the comic and that is the corner box. So there's a certain head missing from there and that's Colossus. But Storm is still part of the gold team so interesting choice because you could certainly extend that box down and have room for Storm's face there. Nonetheless, uh, let's open this one up to the splash page. And the title of the story is Mixed Blessings. And the creative team here, Scott Lobdell, writer, John Romita Jr., penciler, Dan Green and Alve Inkers. So I'll point out the point. Uh, at which Alve takes over the inking. So Dan Green starts and does most of the issue, but the last few pages are by they. Chris Eliopoulos, letterer, Steve Bacilato, colorist. And I think Bacilato does a very good job on the colors here, evoking the autumnal, or as Americans would say, fall setting of the story, because the story is set on Thanksgiving. So it starts in the morning and ends in the evening. It's a kind of like a day uh, long story. And one of these, uh, by now, at this point, classic Lobdell quiet issues when he's able to do uh, his own thing. One last uh, bit I'll mention here is the, um, the credits uh, design here is in the shape of an engagement ring, if you note that. So a nice little kind of aesthetic, uh, stylistic detail there. Love this opening splash page image of uh, Scott and Jean in their um, autumn jackets and attire walking through the uh, grounds of Xavier's mansion and then we've got in the background um, a little kind of memory image of Jean in her first X-Men uniform from way back at the very beginning 1963 and the first few issues designed by Jack Kirby that Jack Kirby classic X-Men uh, uniform. So the uh, narrative captions say it's a morning, Thanksgiving morning, where the very air snaps with the promise of change, where the bright crispness commands a lifting of hearts and a joining of spirits. So appropriate for what's happening here. Scott asks Jean uh, what she's thinking about. And she says, honestly, that instant, I was thinking about the very first moment of recognition between people. The instant strangers can become the closest of friends. I was thinking, Scott, of the very moment I realized, let's turn the page. We're gonna to have to turn it uh, to the horizontal, to the old landscape format. Make sure you can get all of that in there on camera of the past. And it is Gene visiting Scott in the danger room while he's working on the, uh, on aspects of the danger room, obviously this kind of death ball up here. And um, she continues and says, the, the instant she was thinking back to was the one in which she realized that Scott was the one and he asked the one. And then she says, every teenaged girl is assigned one guy with a capital O, Scott. The guy to pine away for, the guy to get weak kneed and tongue tied over. At least that's what my mother told me. I used to laugh at her telling her times had changed. Then I joined the X-Men. You ever wonder why mothers are always right? So then we get into their dialogue there where she's saying to him, um, I mean, this room is, and he says, off limits, Gene. The professor calls it the danger room, a training center designed to, and then she quotes, obviously from the prospectus or manual, help students here at Xavier School for gifted youngsters develop their individual mutant powers within a closely monitored environment. I know, Slim, I read the survival guide. I was issued during orientation. So he says, sure, okay, I guess you're in here. If you're in here, maybe you can hand me a wrench or something. Let's pull this up, get all of this on camera. And she says, Slim, can I ask you a personal quest question? What is your real name? So then this is the moment he says, mm, my real name is Scott Summers. Scott it is then. That's a great image here of young Jean 
uh, really kind of expressing her, um, her, what shall I say, her um, crush on Scott in that moment. Just great body language, great facial expressions by John Romita Jr., really nicely done. And then the adult pairs, they think back and reminisce about it all. And he remembers falling off the ladder, uh, not too embarrassing. And you weren't embarrassing, she says to him. And let's get this the right way up. You were cute, she says, as she grabs him with her telekinetic power and lifts him off the ground and the wrench too. And um, he says of the whole business, remembering back, what a smoothie I was back then and subtle too. Are you sure you're not embellishing these memories? I really shouted, get clear. Really, really, she says. And then they're interrupted in their reminiscences about the early days of the X-Men and their first meetings by the arrival of Beast and Jubilee. And um, they're stomping around the uh, fallen leaves on the grounds, but they're actually, after having caused a problem here for Aroro, Sean and Forge, who have been cleaning up all morning, she says here in frustration, I love the body language here as well. Sean Forge and I have spent the last three hours raking these leaves by hand because they insisted it would be, how do they put it, therapeutic. In less than three seconds, you've totally undermined our efforts. So the beast here, a thousand pardons, almighty Lee Dress, a million pardons, a Google pardons. It does not matter, she says. Okay, okay, infinity pardons, but that's as far as it goes. A man has got to have a little dignity as he's lying there covered in the, in the leaves. And um, he just keeps uh, throwing them up in the air. And uh, Scott and Jean have a good laugh at it, Scott in particular. And then he picks up this football uh, from beneath the leaves. And um, he says, who has time to play games when there's an entire world out there that needs saving, that needs saving? And she says, actually, that's what I wanted to talk to you and uh, that's why I wanted to talk to you to ask about our own little corner of and then they're interrupted by conversation here between Gambit, Rogue, Iceman and Bishop. And I have to ask a question. Uh, what is Gambit wearing here? This is obviously, uh, obviously uh, the height of fashion back in 1993, 94, but wow. Does it look? <laughs> it looks ridiculous from the vantage point of 2023. Let me know what you think about this uh, in the comments. Did you ever wear anything like this back in the day? And so they're building a scarecrow here, Dr. Doom covered in uh, leaves. And um, they're having a little bit of fun at Bishop's expense because he really doesn't get like the traditions of the, of the 20th century. But he explains here, I spent my childhood in constant flight from the end plates for fear they'd suck the marrow from the bones of my sister and me. And Bobby responds, oh, well, oh yeah, well, you have to admit making faux dooms is a lot funner. Um, so here we have them getting the idea for um, a game of football. Scott throws the football to Iceman and Iceman says, look, this is a football. And Bishop says, I see neither a foot nor a ball. Don't let the details dog you or, uh, bog you down, says Iceman. And then Jean um, compliments Scott, you know, on the fact that he doesn't even realize he's doing it. Being here for all of us, finding the right words. There have been times you've been here for me and you hadn't even known it. And then we get this interesting flashback again to the very beginning of Jean's time in the school when she's getting these migraines, a thousand thoughts are pounding in her head, all trying to burst out of her brain. And we get an explanation here of how uh, Professor X set up some sonic safeguards in her mind after the traumatic event of Jean being in her best friend Annie's mind while she died in her arms after being run over by a car. Um, she, she talks about how her mother and father eventually brought her here 
to Professor X's school and you spent months caring for me, drawing me back into the real world. And that's when he set up those sonic safeguards. But his suspicions are now that her uh, love for an interest in Scott is bringing down those sonic barriers. Apparently your attraction to Scott, your crush on him, if you will, is so strong you're mentally reaching out to him, circumventing the fail safes I put in place. Instinctively, you're trying to connect, to share with another person, as is quite natural for a young woman your age. And she asks him, okay, well, what if he doesn't love me back? It's called a risk, child, he says. And so he bids her good night. There's gonna have some training in the morning. And then she says here, I must have sat there for almost half an hour. Again, this is a great, facial expression um, on young Jean's face here and here uh, capturing her love struck uh, emotions um, and she says I must have sat there for almost half an hour that low pea grin plastered to my face waiting to make sure the coast was clear then I reached out with every happy thought I could and pulled the side print out of thin air it was the first time I'd ever really used my sonic power and he says, you never told me that? Psychic rapport notwithstanding, there are a lot of things I never told you, Mr. Summers, she says here in the present. That's a great shot of her standing in the present as well. Tremendous art by John Romita Jr. in this issue. He's really gotten into his groove with his return to the X-Men by this point and the previous issue as well. He's really settled down with the art, with the characters, um, the storytelling. I just wish he wouldn't do those uh, landscape uh, page, page layouts. There's another couple of those in this issue. And then we're um, back to uh, the X-Men out on the, uh, the domain, the lawn. Um, they're getting ready to play their game of football while Jean and Scott continue reminiscing. And they reminisce about the time uh, they were fighting for their very survival up against the Shi'ar Imperial Guard on the moon and how an attack on Scott, make sure that you can see all of this, whoops, oh dear, reattach the microphone, that's never happened before, always the first time, um, so make sure you can see all of that there, um, and so the reminiscing about this time that Scott was uh, shot by one of the Imperial Guard here, and she says uh, that um, her soul shattered when she thought you'd been that Cyclops had been killed by a stray blast. I didn't care what they did to me, to the Phoenix at that point. I only knew I had to stop them from hurting you, she says. I risked everything. I reached deep down into my soul and lashed out with everything I had. And here we go. In order to protect you, Scott, Sometimes I think if I hadn't, hadn't, and he picks up, gotten through to the Phoenix power gene, if you hadn't ultimately gotten it to destroy itself, but you did. From some cocoon on the bottom of the East River, all that was pure and true and good about you reached out and saved us all. If you're telling me you found the strength to do that through our love for one another, I'm honored, pretty lady, but the truth of the matter is you and you alone are the one who did it. So we're getting a lot of mutual admiration uh, by each for the other in this issue. And um, it's all in the run up to the engagement. And here at the bottom of the page here, just make sure you can see all of that. We have an interlude Saint, uh, in St. Louis, Missouri, or St. Louis rather, Missouri. And this is interesting, a pleasant home, a quiet street. His name is unimportant. He could be anyone. Anyone who's given up the notion that the government will protect him and his family from a world gone suddenly rife with menace. But unlike all those other anyones, this man intends to do something about it by any means necessary. And on the back of this bus, phalanx. So some foreshadowing here of the upcoming phalanx covenant. And that's been going on for a few issues now in Lobdell's uh, Uncanny X-Men um, run. And then we're back with the football game and the huddle. And we've got Forge with his uh, instructions. With everyone assuming a 59 degree variant, I'll propel 
the trajectory or sorry the projectile at a maximum rate of 19 feet per square and then bishop just says there i'm not following any of this and i an irish man am not following any of it either so i'm exactly on board with bishop's perspective there and anyway so they face off against each other and who we've got we've got uh we've got bishop forge iceman gambit rogue versus jubilee storm uh revanche and uh beast so uh i like i like this little sequence here as well the storytelling here where forge is thinking about where he's gonna uh pass the ball to throw the ball to so he's throwing it towards gambit here and uh storm is getting in the way and um he calls her here to annoy her and put her off part of my charm stormy and she says here i should just tackle you. i should tackle you just for calling me that ridiculous name and what that's a really nice call back to their time in um new orleans um and uh issues two 266 67 of uh uncanny x-men um, when uh, that was uh, the way that Gambit used to call her and it did and it annoyed her then and it still annoys her now. It's a little call back to their relationship at that time. And then in swoops Archangel to steal the ball and it hasn't been decided whose side he's on. And then we've got Scott and Jean watching um, from a little hilltop here, the game. And Scott says, from a distance, they almost sound like a family. Of course, the X-Men are found family. Uh, for these outsiders from norm normal society um, and but Scott is a little bit pensive there almost he he says and Jean asks him Scott do you ever wonder what it would be like well to have a family to start a family of our own and Scott makes the points of course we already have a family of our own Jean sort of Jean says I'm not talking about Rachel here's Rachel a daughter from the future i'm talking about you and me taking responsibility for our lives today in the here and now and not getting bogged down in the end result of a timeline that may or may not come to pass granted no one was angrier than i was when i first met her it was as though the universe had already plotted out the rest of my life and all i had left to do was to go through the motions and that's interesting because claremont really dealt with that um that's uh, exactly what Gene is talking about there in Uncanny X-Men Annual number 14. There's a video on it on the channel, The Days of Future uh, Present, uh, the Ahab um, series of annuals, but in, the, in Annual 14 of Uncanny X-Men, he deals with all of this. And she says, uh, and he asks her, and what's changed that Gene? Everything, everyone, from Peter leaving to Logan's injuries to the professors opening the doors to Sabretooth. Now, this is something that could do with a footnote here. It happened in X-Men Unlimited number three. And she continues, there are no constants in this life, Scott. No master plan, no lifetime warranty. Let's make sure you can see this. What about the son I did have with, and he, he kind of hesitates and stumbles there with, Madeline. What about Nathan, Jean? It's not as if anyone's ever going to confuse me with Father of the Year, eh? And she says to him, look, she was there. She's never experienced a bond as strong as the one that existed between you and Nathan. The decision you made to send him into the future saved his life. That sacrifice alone was more than any man should be asked to make, is the uh, missing word. Great anchor image here of that key moment from X Factor. And we've got... A footnote here by Bob Harris, and he gets it wrong. In the classic X Factor 67. No, Bob, it's X Factor 68, okay? And um, then they're interrupted by some uh, dialogue from the game. So uh, we have, who's got the ball there? It looks like it's Iceman's got the ball. And Ford says, we're six points, we're down six points, and he's looking for his motivation. And then Professor X is out in his wheelchair. Ladies, gentlemen, dinner served. Perfect, says Iceman. What better way to celebrate our victory than a pleasant turkey dinner? But he's uh, tackled by Forge, drops the ball. Um, and who's there to pick it up? Well, Revanche goes for it. Storm. And then everybody's after the ball here. Love this image. It's quite comical as well. And by the way, this is the point that Alve takes over the inking. 
So the last page, Dan Green, but now we're on to Alve for the rest of the issue. And uh, so they're running after the ball. Professor X catches it. That's a big mistake. And um, he's basically mauled here by all four jumping on him to get the ball. Ouch, says Scott. And then um, we get to the proposal. So who's going to propose to whom? And uh, as Scott is watching, smiling at the comic moment, he says, I'll be right back, Gene. The professor is, he's got to look out for the professor, pull him out from under uh, all of these guys. And she says to him, marry me. And so notice it's not a question. It's a declaration. And Scott's taken by surprise. What, what did you say? And look at this. This is egregious stuff, okay? So I remember this at the time. Uh, this speech balloon, empty. So this was a production error. And in upcoming issue of the title, in the letters page, they showed us what Jean said here. And basically what she says is, I'm tired of waiting. That's what's missing. And then he uh, responds, waiting. I asked you to marry me almost. And in fairness to Bob Harris, he gets this one right in X Factor number 53. That is exactly right. And she says, I wasn't ready then. I was afraid, afraid of what our life would be like, what our future would be like if we were together. And now, he says, now I'm afraid of what my life would be like without you. Married or not, that would never happen. Scott, through it all, our love has been the one constant in my life, she says. Pass these pages back to the story. When I was young, withdrawn, frightened, your love challenged me to be more than I was, to become all I was capable of becoming. You gave me the strength to open my mind, my heart. And he responds, uh, um, no, she says, our love was enough to stop the Phoenix, Scott, enough to save an entire universe. I have to believe it is strong enough that we can change a future that seems to have been planned for us. Rachel suffering at the hands of the Sentinels, Bishop and his paramilitary XSE, Everything we've learned about Nate and Christopher. Our love is stronger than destiny, Scott. It has to be. What about the X-Men? This is our home, Scott. We belong here, she says. You'd a tale that turns a little bit more around. I like, uh, towards Jean, I like the little reflection of her face here in um, Scott's ruby quartz glasses. That's a nice little detail there by J.R. J.R. Um, we belong together, <clears throat> she says. I'd no sooner ask you to leave then I'd ask you to grow another arm. So this is the reversal of what happened when Scott married Madeline. And that was Claremont's happy ending for Scott that he would go off and have a life with Madeline, have children and would only ever come back like for special um, occasions, um, um, you know, key missions with the X-Men, but otherwise live his own life with Madeline. And here Jean is saying, look, they're not going to leave the X-Men. They're not going to uh, walk away from uh, their, their, their family, the X-Men. This isn't about change for change's sake, she says. It's about spending the rest of our lives together as husband and wife. So what do you say, Mr. Summers? And he responds, I say, I love you, Ms. Gray, today, tomorrow, and every day for the rest of my life. So that's really well written by Lobdell, you know. Uh, nicely done. And here we go, another landscape layout from John Romita Jr. And guys, I've never had a Thanksgiving dinner being Irish, but is this supposed to be a turkey here? I don't know. I think it is supposed to be a turkey, but it's incredibly flat. I don't know what's happened to this turkey, um, but it doesn't look the most appetizing. But anyway, key thing is we've got all the X-Men gathered around the dining room table here in the X-Mansion. And we've got some um, family guests as well. We've got uh, Bobby's parents here. Uh, I like this little detail of Psylocke sitting directly opposite from Re Revanche. And uh, we have, who else do we have here? We have Stevie um, Hunter here, uh, Kitty's old dance instructor. We have uh, Trish Tilby here uh, with her arm on um, the beasts here, on Hanks. And we've got Moira and Sean here, of course, and Jubilee up there. Um, sitting up beside the professor. So the professor taps his knife on the glass here to get the attention of everyone. I love the detail of the plaster on his nose and on his, uh, just over his uh, 
his uh, forehead here as well. If I might have everyone's attention, he asks. For those of you who have joined us before, you know that for me, Thanksgiving has always been my own personal New Year's Day. It is the day of the year when we are given to reflecting upon all that has gone on before us throughout the seasons. A day when instead of recalling the multitude of deeds which we have yet to accomplish, instead of dwelling upon the opportunities we've missed, we're encouraged to be grateful for all that is good in our lives and ourselves. And Jubilee here whispering, oh yeah, we've had a real banner year. It's interesting here because they had such fun earlier, but now Beast is serious. He says, shush, irreverence has its time and its place, child. This is neither. So that's a nice little detail, you know. Oh, still landscape format. Oops. And my mic has slipped off again. Don't know what's going on today. And the professor here isn't annoyed. He says, actually, Jubilee makes a valid point. Since the day I gathered you first among, since the day I gathered the first among you to my side and asked each and every one of you to make the decision to build a better world for everyone, I'm hard pressed to recall a year when we've been called on to face, face such bitter tragedies. So he goes through them all, the death of Ileana, Peter's departure, Logan's injuries. And he says, look, we've survived. Much more than that, however, I believe, as I feel you all do, that we've grown stronger because of what we've endured. And he says, whatever the reasons, I'm thankful for our sense of family, which grows, which strengthens every year. And I like these headshots of the X-Men here. And you, begin, you see how Romita Jr. has a distinctive way of drawing each one. So it's not just a generic style for the faces they have their own little characteristic uh, features. And Professor X continues for our friends, both here and abroad. Finally, although we strive for the day when we are no longer needed, I'm thankful that for today, at least there are those of you willing to call yourselves X-Men. And then Scott politely interrupts and says, if I may, sir, Jean and I have something we'd like to add. And then Jubilee, don't tell me she finally got a code name. No Jubilee, nothing that exciting. Scott, and here we are, final page, here it comes. Well folks, after much consideration and a heck of a lot of soul searching, Jean and I decided there was only one thing we could do, we're getting married, and everybody's absolutely delighted. And then the narrative captions conclude, over the, fa over the past few years, this house has been host to many sights and sounds, the roaring din of battle, the mourning whisper of death's kiss, Imagine then the joy that swells within the heart of Charles Xavier at seeing the smiles upon his students' faces, at the sound of their laughter echoing off the mansion's walls. While he has some reservations about the decisions made here this day, he chooses to keep them to himself. For these few moments, his children are happy. For that, above all else, he's grateful. And in the next issue, we'll get to those uh, surprising, at least at this point, reservations about the decision made here today we'll see what those are in the next issue great coloring here as well with the sunset so as i said like it opened in the morning it's ending now at sunset thanksgiving day at the x mansion and gene proposing to scott and scott accepting and now they're engaged and the next thing up will be the wedding uh just one thing to mention here in the letters page tease about Gener generation x uh the upcoming new x title so it's on the way I do hope that you enjoyed this review and commentary on Uncanny X-Men 308. And if you did, please like the video in YouTube. And if you haven't done so already, subscribe to the channel and stay tuned for more content like this.